but they had as good maps as were typical. Now the seven days, which I alluded to briefly, nobody knew where in the world they were on those roads. It's not as big a deal in the valley, I don't think, really. Anyone else? Use them up, Colonel. No, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What impact does Jackson's newfound reputation have on Stonewall Jackson? On himself. There are biographers who claim that he had, uh, he had the overweening ambition that a lot of humans would have in that case. And there is one source for that, seeing that gleaming. It's Dick Taylor, who I alluded to earlier, said he thought he saw it once. But I have spent uh, more than four decades finding everything in the world I can about Jackson and his corps, particularly in his campaigns. And I've, I suppose I've seen as many contemporary accounts of Jackson and his behavior as anybody, anybody in the world ever has. And I think he was exactly what he appeared, a old-fashioned, deeply religious predestinarian who believed he was God's instrument in, on earth, trying to do his level best, and a man without a lot of human skills. He has more breadth than he has often been painted. His library survives, and uh, there are more books of history than religion in it. There are books in four different languages. A set of Shakespeare, which is dog-eared and has marks in it. Books about sculpture and painting from his trip to Rome with his marginalia in it. So I don't want to paint you a wooden man here or a narrow man or a thin, a thin creature, but far more straightforward than almost all the people we run into. And I know there is the psychological construction that the people who appear the um, most straightforward or the most complex and they're holding it in. So I leave you to master that on your own. I don't care one way or the other. I think Jackson is what he appeared and what he was. A really determined fellow who thought he was doing God's will and to the best of his ability. But another thing that he unquestionably was is a man who was destined to be almost unknown by many human gauges of failure and of the tiniest possible ripple in a pond had the war not come. Uh, people have made the parallel to George Patton. I guess it's a good one. I won't try to defend it. George Patton's people were born across the street from where I live. I'm some interested in him. But the, the kind of person who crops up in world history, particularly military history, who's not going to be a success or significant or remembered except by very, very few intimates, and not all that favorably had the war not come where his tunnel vision, his one ideadness was the perfect thing to carry him through. A couple of, of quotes for you, a couple of thoughts about Jackson's overall persona. The, it, one of them is that he said to an acquaintance at one point, talking about this inability to interact with people, said, I have no capacity for seeming and that's pretty revealing. And the other thought is that I believe his greatest talent on a battlefield was not tactical or operational or strategic. It was probably rooted in part on his religious determinism that was part of his makeup. He had his jaw clenched more tightly than anybody on either side of the lines. His subordinates who thought he was crazy, the Federals on the other side of the line, and when he came out on the plane at Port Republic and he saw the coaling and grasped fairly quickly what its importance was, he was just going to take that. There were a lot of reasons not to. There were a lot of things that could have gone wrong. Most of them did go wrong, but he just really stuck to it. That sounds plain, and it probably is. The other question the most often posited about Jackson, which grows from this to some degree, is given the paucity, the complete absence of capacity in the Confederate Western theater, Braxton Bragg, for goodness sake. Gideon Pillow, for double goodness sake. Pemberton, et cetera. And you have the tremendously successful Lee and Jackson in this theater. Why not send Jackson West to take over the army there? And there you get into the defects of his virtues. The one ideadness the focus. This inability to get along with his subordinates when they had to do what he told them would not have worked in army command. He'd have had 
most of the Army of Tennessee under arrest and facing court. And two-thirds of them deserved it, but then how do you run the Army thereafter? So he, he had, um, in Lee, he had set up the perfect framework in which to exercise his narrow but powerful abilities. And in another setting, not so much. Hi, I was just curious, um, what were the opinion of his peers? You saw obviously his subordinates and what their opinion of him was, but I'm curious what the other generals around him, uh, what their opinion of him was. Also, what effect did his death have on uh, the armies of both sides of the border, politically and militarily? Um, in particular, when you talk about someone who died at the apex of their career, yeah. it almost codifies around that. Um, I was curious, was that demoralizing? Was it encouraging for the South to say, we'll move on from this and, and, and and mm -hmm. act as if he was still here. But I was just curious what effect that had on both sides of the... Well, I've talked about his, the attitude of not his peers, but his immediate subordinates. There were almost no genuine peers. There was only one during his lifetime. That was James Longstreet. Longstreet was painfully, I would think embarrassingly, if you're a Longstreet supporter, they're everywhere. You can't get away from them. I don't understand it. But I would think uh, he almost unquestionably was jealous of Jackson. His memoir looks like that. That's, I suspect, the primary thought going on with the one real peer he had at the time. An interesting question about the attitudes from above, when for the first time the Confederate Congress created a corps, the military formation of a corps, and then the lieutenant general's rank to lead the corps was the second week of November of 1862. And at that point we get a lovely insight into what Lee and Jefferson Davis thought of him. Jefferson Davis obviously wrote, the incoming from Jeff Davis does not survive, so far as anyone knows, but the, it obviously said to Lee, he said, well, you're proposing Longstreet and Jackson for the two lieutenant generalcies in the Army and for the newly organized Corps, and Davis must have said, are you sure after the mess around Richmond? Because Lee's letter, which does survive, going back, says, ever since the campaign around Richmond, Jackson has been everything that I could want him to be and more. So there's... Jeff Davis is kind of a little bit of worrying about him. In the aftermath, what about Jackson's absence, uh, dying at the absolute height of his, of his success? The question I've been asked more than any other in many years of standing before groups like you and all over the country and talking about these things is, what if Jackson had been at Gettysburg? And this, of course, is the night of the first day of July there on the slopes around the Culp House, just below Culp's Hill, East Cemetery Hill where Ewell dithered while Cemetery Heights burned, one of the great decisive moments in the history of the war, maybe in the history of the country. And everyone wants to know, what if Jackson had been there? Well, that's a completely illegitimate bit of a parallel universe because were Jackson alive, the odds are millions to one that they would have been at Gettysburg. You take an Army of Northern Virginia configured into two corps commanded by Longstreet and Jackson, as opposed to one divided into three corps commanded by Hill, Ewell, and Longstreet, and move them across half the eastern time zone through three states, every intersection, every crossroads, every skirmish is a moment for decision and change. They wouldn't have wound up at Gettysburg. Knowing Jackson, they might have been in Cleveland by this time. But there wouldn't have been a Gettysburg. But what people are asking, they want you to hoist Jackson in like the god of the machine in the Greek play. Drop him at the foot of East Cemetery Hill where the reconfigured army has arrived after four or five weeks on the road, what happens then? Well, that I think is inarguable. Jackson, try, uh, it's beyond question. Jackson tries to go up the hill. I think it's very close to beyond question that he would have taken the hill. Now, this doesn't end the war and negotiate peace on Pennsylvania Avenue. It means you wouldn't have heard of Gettysburg. Gettysburg is a one-day battle, like many another, and maybe the Pipe Creek line becomes the big showdown. But Jackson would have tried to go up the hill, and I think it's, although I argue with my colleagues about this on the battlefield at times, take the other position, a lot of Yankees up there and so on, to have covered 125 miles in this raid into the north, 125 miles from the nearest railhead in Stanton, Virginia, to reach Gettysburg, to have routed two federal corps on July 1. July 1 taken by itself is one of the greatest days in the history of the Army of Northern Virginia. You don't think about Gettysburg that way. To have done that and then not try to ride the crest of the momentum you've created with so much time, sweat, effort, and blood is just about unthinkable, says I. 
One more. Yes, um, during the Valley Campaign, uh, Jackson, his troops basically were called foot cavalry because yeah. they moved around so quickly. Yeah. Uh, the heck with take, you know, attempting to go and do taking the hill. Uh, if what do you think of the idea that he probably could have gone and outflanked the Union with his corps, with his army? Uh, at, at Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Well, that certainly, he would have been looking for that opportunity. Of course, he died looking for that opportunity at Chancellorsville. He'd won a tremendous success. He was looking, how do we get between the Federals and the Rappahannock? His last, uh, last orders to Dorsey Pender, uh, to A.P. Hill, uh, cut them off from the United States forward, press them. Uh, he, was, he was looking for that. He would have been looking for that at Gettysburg. But he would have been looking for similar opportunities in Berryville, Virginia, and uh, Western Maryland and South Central Pennsylvania, and they would have led him somewhere else almost surely. So that's why that seems to me to be. Uh, well, ca counterfactual history is a great deal of fun. We all do it. Uh, we all sneer at it a little bit if we have pretensions of professionalism, but we all do it, and there's no reason not to. Right on time to quit. Well, very quickly, we'd like to give you a token of appreciation, Bob which is a uh, coin for the OSD Historical Office. So you're one of the first recipients of that. Thank you. Would this help me parking if I come up here? <laughs> <laughs> no, you need, you need a higher authority for that. Uh, very quickly, to let you know about next couple of presentations, on 17 July at high noon, we have Christopher George coming to speak to us about the opening months of the War of 1812. And just to note, that will be in B6 in the Pentagon Conference Center, not here because uh, this wasn't available that day. And then on 28 August, we'll be doing something on the Vietnam advisory effort, and we'll have uh, in primarily General Tony Zinni here talking about that, and we're looking to find an Army general who was also an advisor to come and talk with us that day as well. So I hope that's a presentation that uh, everybody can make it to. And again, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day and coming by to see our speaker. Take care.